Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Parfe Tokono, and uh, I present to you some work I'm, uh, we are doing in my university about dual execution with a uh, Gnode framework. It is not really related to a micro uh, system, but since we are working on a micro operating system, I think it is, uh, it is worth com uh, to come and present something about what we are doing. So it will be essentially about how we can run and rerun program or process in Gino with a new technique that I will present you in the following slides. So, my presentation will follow this outline. Uh, I will give some introduction to the dual execution and comparison. After that, I will present what uh, the technique we are applying to the subject, uh, systematic process element we play. I will also talk about some possible usage, <coughs> usage and uh, advantage that we have with the system how we play with Gino framework and um, the current state of the work, performance impact, and I will end by some remaining work that we will see. So, for the introduction, uh, DWC, uh, as you know, it dual, double uh, execution with comparison. The main uh, general purpose is to detect error and uh, take action to recover. It's a speci uh, it is in the field of fault tolerance. This fashion of executing program may also be used for debugging or software verification and uh, hardware testing, but in what we are doing, we are specifically do it, doing it for fault tolerance. So generally, this double execution may happen in parallel or some there are other people that do it simultaneously but one execution bit delayed with the first but others can do it also in sequence that is what we we are doing here and it also may happen at instruction level or at a set of instruction level for what we are doing, we are specifically doing it for a set of instruction levels. But, and to make it detect error, uh, each execution must be uh, deterministic. So we have to play, it, uh, play uh, the instruction, we take it again, the same instruction, of the same data, in the same environment, so we must have, we are guaranteed to have the same result. So we make, uh, do comparison and see what if uh, there was an error in one execution or not. So that is the basic idea. So other people have done something like that. You can see in the literature, uh, primary backup hypervisor based full turn of from pre-suit, other virtual machine based security system that they call revert and uh, other fashion of doing it, a hardware assisted deterministic replay from uh, Montesinos, they call it Capo, if you want, if there are some reference that you can consult. So concerning what we are doing, the basic idea is to apply the dual execution to a set of instructions, and uh, we also take in account some limit of time that that is, our dual execution must not exceed some time limit. So we, are, we have to hold also this constraint. So to achieve this goal, uh, we, what we are doing is essentially to modify the kernel of a, an operating system. In this case, we are modifying the kernel that Gnode use of you know, eight, uh, S86, X86 hardware that is Nova. So we are modifying the Nova kernel. So that for each process, we, the kernel divides the process in short element, processing element that we call PE. We run them twice 
and uh, make the comparison between each running result. <coughs> so if the, sorry. So if the comparison is the, uh, the same, re the result are the same, so we, we consider that the execution was okay, they match, and we can proceed to the next processing element. If so, uh, a hardware error happens during one of the execution, so surely one of the execution will be different from the other, so, and the comparison will not be the same. So we consider that there was a problem and we have to restart the same processing element. But if, also, if there was an, an expected exception, so all we have to do is to restart all the entire, uh, the entire process. So the, third, the three phases, um, first run, second run, and comparison, verification, and commitment, we call these three things uh, operational transaction. That, that is the set of operations that have to be done or neglected. If it is not okay, so we have to restart the entire op operational transaction. So for this, for all of this to hold, the processing element must be atomic in the, and uh, in the potent. So n we do all our best that there is no interaction with the outside world and uh, no input output. We end our processing element at each input output that we have to do with the outside world. Uh, every dependent, uh, time dependent instruction because uh, there is no way to run uh, the same time dependent instruction that it will return the same results. So even we have to run this kind of instruction, we have to end our processing element. So that are some criteria to fill our goal. The main things happen, we have to also to stop the processing element if we, the process makes some exception, page folds, or this kind of stuff, so that we keep the processing element so short to hold in the time. So, in practice, what we have to do is to compare each processing element result, that is the memory page that it modifies. So if we process modify three pages, we have to compare the content of these three memory pages and see that if they are the same. We also, the, the same thing happened to the register that uh, process may have modified. So we also have to compare all the mm, process related register. So for the following, I will present in, in the next slide how we do the process. And for you to follow me, we'll, we'll, we will call EN, the end for what prof, process, end processing element that we will do. The first execution will be the, uh, called EN1, and the second processing element execution will, call, will be called EN2. About memory pages, we'll call PM1, the modified page, uh, PM page during the first execution, and PM2, the modified uh, page in the second execution. So, how we do it? Before the first execution, we save all the register. We also save all the memory page that the process can may modify in, during its execution. So, to keep trace of all modified process page, we, we set all the memory page read-only. And so that if the process try to modify the page, it will fault. Uh, in the kernel and we'll treat these faults. So during the first execution, we try to construct the set of assessed or modified memory page. And we keep it in a list so that at the end of the two execution, we, we will make 
the comparison. We will do the comparison. So essentially, and after the first execution, we also have to flush the cache so that the processor will need to fetch new uh, the data from the main memory so that he it will not uh, uh, he it will be obliged to it will not use data that he it have kept in its cache during the first run so that all the data he will work on will be fresh data so at the end of the second run we make the comparison and as i said just as, as I have just said, if everything is okay, we can proceed to this first, uh, to this uh, following processing element. And if there is a problem, we just have to restart the same, the same operational transaction until there, there is no error. So I, can, I may recall that the error I'm talking about, that uh, transient error or soft error that may appear in the CPU register, and um, after some rewriting in the register of catch, this error may disappear. Disappear. So to do this work, it's happened that we will have to make for each page that the process will modify. We have to make three copies for each page. The same thing for. The comparison. We also do comparison, and sometimes we notice that during its execution, the process may modify up to ten memory page or memory frame. So we have to do to do all this comparison in the time limit that we must not exceed, and also, yeah, we we must also keep to the operating system to respect its service constraints about application. So there is a lot of work to do in the kernel, but also real-time constraints must be met. So now, this technique of dual execution has already been applied. A question? Yes, a okay. I really think the number of pages changed no, no. The process can change its page, and uh, yeah, I when it does some specific exception not related to our, our technique, so we will end the transaction. But if it is. Uh, to start the process, we set all its speed to read only. If this, its access is uh, for this kind of page, there is no problem. So we have on, we we will give this page back to it so that it can continue its work. So basically, this idea has already been applied to a simple process running on bare, uh, on a metal bare metal machine without any operating system in uh, 1911 <coughs> but and there is also another work that uh, another phd student is doing to put this technique to operating system and but concerning general what we are trying is we are essentially trying to do is to try this um, concept on virtual machine support so that we'll see if we can do all this stuff in the kernel while supporting virtual machine uh, service. So one concern is about how we stop the processing element. We said that we have con time constraint. So if the process really release release uh, the CPU from its own. That's okay. From in its own, that may happen when the process make a system call, for example. So we'll start. We'll we'll stop the processing element, or when it faults, uh, it wants to access 
a new page that he needs the kernel to give it, or the pager, uh, pay, uh, memory manager to give it. So we will start the process. We will stop the processing element. But if the process do <coughs> a lot of work without releasing the CPU, when the time limit is uh, exhausted, we have to stop. We also have to stop the process. And this we do it by issuing a time bar interrupt so that we could hold in the time limit. So that is basically the, the idea how we manage to make our processing element not exceeding the quantity time limit. So when we apply it to Genode, we are essentially interested in three questions. The first is, is it possible to do it like that for virtual machine running on um, a microkernel system like that? Essentially, we will also want to measure the performance impact that this fashion of executing pro a process will have on this kind of system. And uh, also, we, are, we will try to reduce to short, to shorten the time, the granting time until we can uh, find the, maxim <coughs> the maximum time that will we cannot exceed. That is, maybe we'll find 10 microseconds. All our operational transaction must hold on in 10 microseconds, or maybe 100 microseconds. We don't know. So when will be uh, as, a, as a size in the system, we'll find what is the maximum time limit that we can hold so that all, all the system may continue running normal. So basically, that have a five, uh, three questions. Now, we cannot answer this question because the work is not fully uh, completed, but we have some we already have some results that give us some insight of what the system may be after it will finish. Firstly, we noticed that the, that is just a chronogram showing how the process execution is, uh, is, go, is uh, going. So in the first time slot, we have a user process, and at some, at some time, it will fault in the kernel, or it will be stopped by the timer, and the kernel will take action to restart the same process for the second time, and after the second time, after the second execution finished, we also fall down in the kernel, and we can take action to make uh, the comparison and verification and commitment. So we notice that the second execution is uh, shorter than the first execution. That is normal because after the first execution, we already know all the memory page that the process will modify. So during the second execution, there is no need to, the, pro the process will not have to fault also on this uh, page demand. So we already know all the page that will be modified. So that is why the second execution is shorter than the first. So that is OK. But what we also remark that the, the time we use to, the time <coughs> we spend in the kernel during, between the first execution and the second execution is extremely long. The, our measurement show that uh, we can spend up to 80% of the time doing some doing, uh, doing some work in the kernel between the, these two executions. And uh, after we as a, uh, investigate, we find that it's essentially about the cache flushing. Now the, our cache flushing mechanism takes a lot of time to, to finish. So that means that in the future work, we have to find a better way to optimize this cache flushing mechanism. So about some performance impact, uh, impact. what we, are, we, 
we are projecting to do is to run some benchmark after the system will be fully complete, uh, finished. But now, because it is a, it is an ongoing work, we cannot make the performance impact with great precision. So what we do is to approximate the normal genome execution with the, uh, with the second run. Since the second run is is executed without any uh, page faults, it may be considered as the, as the normal genome execution. So what we do is to take the overall time spent doing the same, the two execution, and we divide it to, uh, on, by the second execution time to find the, an approximation of the performance penalty that we have with this kind of system. So that is the simplest formula we use. And we find that the, for the worst case, that happens during the initialization uh, system booting time uh, period. We find that the overhead, overhead, the overhead could go up to 3,400%. That is very, very huge. But if we, we remove the time spent in cash flushing, we find that there is a more acceptable performance uh, overhead. So when we remove this, this time, we find that the second, the first execution can take on uh, only 40%. The second execution is about 13%. The restart time between the first execution and the second execution is about 13%. And the verification time is only about 28%. Uh, so that, with that, we can say that when we will optimize the cash system, there will be a more acceptable performance impact. So the same thing is uh, when uh, we stop the, the old graph was when the process released the CPU from its own. But we also want to know if we stop the process with time interrupt, what will be the, the performance impact? And it is the same, approximately the same. All the time was spent in the cache flushing. And if we remove the cache flushing, we have uh, this kind of graph, graphic. Uh, and the overhead is very, very less here. It is about only 200%. That is two <coughs> times the normal genode execution. So, uh, and maybe I, I must also say that when we have to stop the process, since we don't know, we have to, when we stop the process, we have to know at which instruction it, stopped, it stops. So what we do now is to count the number of instructions. And for this, we use the uh, Intel counter, uh, instruction counter feature that exists in every CPU. Uh, for what we are doing, we see that the Intel instruction counter is not so precise, or there are some parameters that we must take into account to find the, the exact number of instruction. But if we use, instead of using Intel, if we use AMD, AMD it is more precise. That is what we noticed now, but we are working on Intel CPU for now. And other problem that we have now, it is about some randomly page fault that happen after the system is uh, fully initialized. We don't have, we cannot, we don't know how these page faults appear now, but in the future we will also investigate those problems. So, essentially what is going, we are going to do in the next future work is to try to understand the 
peaceful cause. Optimize the cash flushing uh, system and uh, try to finish the work with virtual machine support so that we can handle more um, heavy tasks, <coughs> I think, uh, like um, running <coughs> all the uh, Hislich his his scenario with uh, Linux running in Gnode, running on a special Nova kernel, w, DWC featured Nova kernel. So that is the state, the current state of the work. Uh, it is not all already finished, totally finished, but that is where we are now. So if you have any remarks or question, I'm at the end of the presentation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. I just I wonder about how do you handle single event offsets in the kernel or in the verification? Single? Do you actually yes, use the the defaults that yeah. you try to protect against as you use single event offset? How do you deal with that in the kernel and in the verification mechanism? I don't uh, get your single event. If you have a SEU in the kernel, you, you talk ah, okay, okay. about protecting the SEU in the oh, Okay, okay. So no. what, what if the SEU uh, hits the kernel when it's running, yeah. not the application process? Okay. Now, what we are doing is only to support uh, user land process. After that, I think protecting the kernel will be, because we have all the kernel will introduce some redundancy code in the kernel that, so that we can make this uh, SEU detection. But now, all our uh, focus, we are focusing on pro user process support. And so you expect that the modification of the kernel will be less big, bigger problem? So your focus is now on the bigger problem, am I correct? No, I don't think that this will be a big deal because now all the problem is supporting any process without knowing what is what the process is doing. But the kernel, we know what we know the kernel, we know the code of the kernel. So it all it will be to uh, make some special um, how to say it, points in the kernel so that we can roll back and going forth and back between the kernel code, that will not be a big deal, I think. Yeah? These transient errors that you mentioned, uh, how often have you seen them? Uh, yeah. is, is, is it happening yeah. regularly, or is it every uh, once in a while? And should I worry about that as an uh, application developer? Yeah, some studies have shown that this kind of error may happen uh, with a probability loss of po poison probability loss, and but that is why we are limiting in the time so that the time constraint is there to to guarantee that there is only one error because if we have two error, we cannot manage to see because if we have, we have two error, the two execution may be may not be valid for comparison. So the main um, criteria is to have only one error. So and that is why we are we may be constrained by certain limit of time. Yes, uh, this kind of error they are not regular they cannot happen regularly. They don't they don't happen regularly but in some time constraint we may be sure that maybe uh, for 10 microseconds or something, a, a, a 100 microseconds, we may be guaranteed to have only one error. So in this kind of situation, we may use the, this technique to detect and correct this kind of error. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah? I'm wondering, have you actually physically observed 
<laughs> no, not yet. So no. have you at least tried to inject some herbs? Yeah, that is, all, that, that is what we'll do af <coughs> at the final stage. When we'll finish, we'll try to inject some uh, experimental error to see how the system uh, resists this kind of error. Thank you. I have a related question. Yeah? It's not for me personally, but from Jakub Yamar who's looking at the live stream, and he wants to know if you have looked into the hardware mechanisms for fault detection and recovery features like they do in the Solaris fault management framework. Are you talking about this slide? Um, I don't know exactly. He, he just wants to know if you have looked into the hardware features to detect failures, like mesh and check abstractions that ah, okay, tell you okay. about memory Other hours. features are, are okay. No, no, now we don't uh, use this kind of feature. Matching check exception or no. For what we are doing now, we don't consider this kind of exception. Um, we are. We are especially interested in, in, in error that may happen and the processor is not aware. That kind, uh, we are interested in this kind of error that may uh, corrupt the content of a register or uh, a, 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 a single memory part in the CPU without the, the CPU knowing that this kind of error has happened. Okay. But if there is um, some error that corrupts the system and uh, the CPU is maybe uh, may get the information back via the matching check exception, I think that will be very uh, easy to, to, to hold. Because for this kind of exception, if it is recoverable, it, is, it has not uh, break the, the CPU, we can take action to recover. But the kind of error we are interested here is those soft error that may happen without the CPU knowing what is that there is, there is a, an error. Those errors are for example SEU error that may happen uh, due to radiation in the space or those kind of stuff but because it is not a conference in for space radiation we I don't we are not going to talk about this kind of error here. Okay? Uh